Welcome to the Startup Grind. I would like everyone to give a warm Startup Grind welcome for Chirac Tartaglia. Thank you. It's on. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being Glad here. To be here. So uh, before we begin, tell us just a little bit about Pritzker Group VC. Yeah, sure. So uh, we are a multi-stage venture capital firm, uh, which means that we invest from seed to growth. The core focus for us is Series A and B investing, where we typically write, on average, four to eight million dollar checks into companies um, that are in the Series A or B stage. Um, we operate out of offices in Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York. Um, we're a generalist firm, so we uh, spend about half our time looking at enterprise companies uh, and the other half of our time looking at consumer-facing companies. Uh, we don't do anything that requires a PhD to understand, so no clean tech, no biotech, um, you know, just sort of core enterprise consumer technology, um, all tech-enabled um, investing. Um, you know, a couple things that make us somewhat differentiated and unique, right? So, uh, one, the source of capital. Uh, we're investing off of the Pritzker family's balance sheet. So, the Pritzker started um, Hyatt Hotels, Royal Caribbean, TransUnion, which is one of the three credit agencies, uh, something called the Marvin Group, uh, which is a diversified industrial company. They sold to Warren Buffett. So pretty illustrious in kind of the Fortune 500 old school industrial and consumer world. Um, JB and Tony Pritzker uh, of the Pritzker family started what's called the Pritzker Group, which is what I work for. Uh, and so we manage their balance sheet and help them invest in emerging and new technologies. Um, so. I think that there's a lot to, to cover in regards to Pritzker and, and your day-to-day -day role. Um, but before we get into that, we'd like to hear a little bit about you. So yeah. tell us about your childhood. Where did you grow up? Yeah. What did your parents do? Sure. And uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I grew up in Chicago, or outside of Chicago, uh, in a small town called Lincolnwood. Um, so I went to Niles West High School. Or, um, yeah, did you go to Niles West? Or? North, oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, same sports league. Um, so uh, that's where I grew up, and then um, my parents, so my grandfather was an entrepreneur. Uh, he started a, uh, his state in India's first paper mill, and so a lot of my early childhood experiences were, you know, interacting with him, hearing about his business. Uh, my dad's an entrepreneur, he owns a uh, chain of retail pharmacies in Chicago, um, and so I grew up, you know, working at a shop and, you know, looked for my little innovative marketing programs, like, you know, offering people at cost cough drops so they would come in the door so that you could then, you know, sell them prescriptions or, you know, sell them other services. And so it was kind of like small, you know, small scrappy entrepreneurship that I was exposed to from pretty early on. How, how early were you actually mixing it up on the floor? Uh, I think like six or seven, like literally it was like after school, during summers, um, you know, just looking for my little way to, to add value. Wow, um, I, think, I think a six or seven year old with an, an idea of what to sell could be pretty powerful. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sure for every good idea, there were like 20 zany ideas, but uh, yeah, and then, and then what I wanted to be, I mean, I don't know, I think I went from, at some point it was like something in politics, but then I realized that, you know, it's sort of most politicians, well, virtually every politician is full of shit, right, and so it's just not the most fulfilling way to spend your time, I don't think, um, and so, um, you know, decided not to do that. I thought about being a journalist. Um, in a lot of ways, I think journalism and venture are similar, right, because you're trying to take a bunch of disparate facts and piece them together in a narrative. And when you're looking at a company or you're looking at an entrepreneur, you're trying to figure out why is this person going to win? Where is this market going? And there's not a clear answer, otherwise it wouldn't be venture, it wouldn't be risk capital. And so um, I think the skills that you know you that the best journalists um, you know use when they're sort of coming up with a scoop or developing a narrative, you know, talking to a bunch of disparate sources and piecing together a piece is kind of a similar it's a similar intellectual exercise to venture capital in that, you know, you're trying to figure out the way the puck is going and, you know, a lot of it at the end of the day is a leap of faith, but, you know, you're talking to a bunch of different people, soliciting opinions, it's really a mosaic approach. So, uh, where did you go to school and entering your college years, what was your, uh, what was your field of study? Yeah, so I went to Swarthmore, it's a small little art school um, outside of Philadelphia. Um, I was in a large public school and so I wanted to go to a small college. Um, my graduating class was 300 people. Um, so, you know, definitely not sort of a big 10, you know, state school experience, uh, or, or even my, my sister went to Stanford, you know, a lot bigger and sort of 
much more of an athletic, fun sort of school. So of course, it's a, it's a quirky little school. Um, I, you know, I had a great time. I studied diaspora studies. So, um, it, you know, again, another sort of quirky uh, major, but um, you know, the goal there was to learn. I was in English. I was in an English literature class my freshman year of college, and um, I was exposed to the fact that people of Indian origin in the 1830s were taken as indentured servants from India to the British colonies because the British had emancipated slaves, but they needed labor to you know, perform tasks on plantations. Um, and so Indians filled that gap. And so I studied kind of the diaspora of Indians spreading across the world. And um, you know, when you think about Indians in America, right, it's a mostly professional diaspora you know, people came here voluntarily, but then you have this really interesting migration narrative um, of Indians in other parts of the world that I found really fascinating. So, and then I did economics to get a job. So that was kind of the- <laughs> Double major. Double major, okay. right, so. <laughs> and so, uh, right out of college, did you, you know, with that background, did you have a good idea of what you wanted to accomplish or, or what your goals were? Yeah, I mean, were? I got lucky. So I, um, you know, I did a fair amount of reading and I had a couple of, um, you know, I, I guess sort of informal mentors and, I knew I wanted to do something business related. I think it was just sort of being around my dad, being around my uh, grandfather. And so, you know, somebody was like, hey, there's this firm called McKinsey and there's this firm called Goldman Sachs. And that's kind of, you know, if you want to do business and you want to do it after undergrad, those are both great training grounds. And so Swarthmore didn't really have a great recruiting program for either one of those firms, uh, but Penn did, which was down the road. And so um, I would sneak into Penn info sessions, um, you know, posing as a Penn student. and. Uh, <laughs> and ended up meeting a McKinsey and a Golden Recruiter, ended up getting offers at both, and ended up going to McKinsey after uh, undergrad. So I spent two years doing the business analyst program. And so talk to us about what the business analyst program at McKinsey is like. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn? Because I feel like that is, that's kind of a foundation that yeah. you can build on top of and that you have built on top of. It's awesome. I mean, it was the best first job on a call. I mean, absent, I think, starting a company, it's like one of the best experiences um, that you know one can have after college. Um, you learn how to take a really big problem and break it down into its component parts, figure out how to, in a data-driven way, figure out, okay, if I'm the CEO of Delta Airlines and I'm losing market share, well, that could be because of you know these eight factors. Let me figure out, let me do analysis against each one of those things, figure out what the exact driver is, then test you know four different programs that I could use to potentially fix that, and you know, hopefully then you know increase my market share, right? So you're dealing with like really important problems for really you know important companies, and you're learning how to break down you know that into really you know com into its little parts, and that's just a sort of really good intellectual exercise that serves I think has served me pretty well in business. When you were at McKinsey, did you start to get an idea of what your strengths and weaknesses were? Yeah, um, partially because you're told them, so there's a pretty rigorous. Uh, <laughs> McKinsey has this up or out mentality. It's kind of the G model as well. It's actually it's a great way of man I think a great way of managing companies where the bottom 10% get weeded out every year, right? So uh, there's no, you know, you want to make sure you don't have excess fat in your company. Um, you know, a lot of corporate America is, um, uh, it's corporate welfare almost, right? Where you have like a, just a lot of mediocrity. And so, um, you know, places like G and McKinsey do a really rigorous job. And I think the best startups do a really rigorous job of, you know, um, what is it, hire slowly and fire really fast, right? And so that was the model of business like McKinsey. Um, and I think, um, so to answer your question then, right? So strengths, I think were always sort of, Relating to people, um, you know, being able to you know work well with uh, senior managers. I mean, I was like a 22 year old kid out of college, and all my clients were you know in their 40s or 50s, and I think sort of just had this natural kind of ability to you know relate to people uh, that were you know quite a bit older. Um, I'd say in terms of things to work on, um, you know, I think um, there's kind of like the over the over exuberance that you have when you're a 22 year old, right? So sort of just figuring out how to like temper some of that and like. These corporate settings, um, less high highs and low lows. Yeah, exactly, right. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, how long were you at McKinsey, and then what was the next step? Yeah, so I did that for about two years, and then this was, uh, so this was oh three to two thousand three to two thousand five, um, and then I left McKinsey to go to uh, a place called Charles Bank. Uh, it's a mid market private equity firm. Uh, we managed Harvard, part of Harvard's endowment, um, and invested it in private equity companies. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so talk to us a, a little more, elaborate on, yeah. on your day to day, going from McKinsey, maybe being more operational to on the investment side of things. Yeah. I mean, 
the investment side is a lot more fun, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, when you're in client services, right? So when you're working at a place like a Goldman or a McKinsey, at the end of the day, you're recommending things to people, but you're not actually doing anything, right? So you're telling the CEO of Delta what to do, or you know, you're helping a company go public, but you're not actually at the company going public, right? You're not actually at Delta helping implement sort of this new thing. And so I always felt like working in those environments were a really good training ground, but they never, you know. You were, you were always one step removed from the action. And so what I really liked about investing um, is that you, know, you could find something and then you could actually take it over the finish line, right? So you could say, hey, I think this is a really cool company. You build a case for it and you're actually able to do something. Um, you don't, once you own the company in the case of private equity or you know, once you're on the board in the case of venture, you just, you, know, you get to effectuate a lot of change in companies um, and work with management teams in a way where um, you know, you're not just a paid recommender Right, but you're actually a aligned party that's you know aligned with the management team to create value. Because um, you know at a place like McKinsey or Goldman, right, like you get paid irrespective of what happens, right? I mean, there's very little performance-based compensation. Whereas when you're an investor, you know your goal and management's goal is aligned, right? You want to create a big value, you know, you you want to create value, you want to create an economic outcome, and so um, there's not that misalignment or that lack of alignment that I think you have in professional services a lot. When you were in McKinsey, did you ever feel like you were uh, being used by different divisions to put pressure on other sides of the company to make strategic moves? Yeah, I was really fortunate. So I, um, I got staffed on really cool projects. One of my last projects in McKinsey was um, the government of Indonesia um, had the tsunami in 2004, but they had no FEMA. And so imagine a country where there's a huge disaster, but you have no disaster relief agency uh, to you know, take sort of all the billions of dollars of capital that we're pouring in, um, you know, channel them effectively to people on the ground. Um, there's just no central disaster agency. And so our job was to design FEMA. And so um, our client was the uh, Prime Minister of Indonesia, um, and our uh, constituents were people like the UN, the World Bank, you know, the Clinton Foundation, or actually no, Bill, well, uh, senior President Bush and, uh, and President Clinton because uh, 43 appointed 41 and 42 as the ambassadors for the US to the, the, the tsunami. And so um, getting to work with people like that, which is pretty exceptional. So, so, so no, so there was not that, I mean, so yes, I think consultants often are kind of brought in to be like rubber stamps for the CEO, right? It's like, it's like, like a cover your ass move, right? It's like, oh, well, McKinsey said I should do it and therefore I'm doing it. Um, uh, but I unfortunately did not, was not staffed on any of those projects. So McKinsey to Charles Bank, yep. um, and you're you're already in private equity early on. Yeah, uh, and then I think you by by now you kind of have a good idea of what you're good at, what you're not good at, uh, and what you're interested in. What was your next move? So my next move, I went to a firm called CBC. It's a European private equity firm. Um, Charles Bank was mostly domestically focused, and uh, CBC was much more international. So it's the biggest European. Uh, private equity firm, and so I got to spend a little bit of time in London, which was cool, um, and um, helped start. So this was my first sort of real, well, I guess FEMA, or helping start FEMA was a pretty entrepreneurial experience as well, but um, you know, this was another great entrepreneurial experience in that I was hired to be part of the founding team for this private equity firm that was starting. And so it was cool to be one of like three or four people on the ground helping start an office, um, you know, helping make hiring decisions, Every, everything from like what furniture are we gonna buy to like, you know, what analysts do we hire? Um, Same know. thing, right? Yeah, totally, totally, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so from CVC, uh, you made a big leap and you decided to go to Wharton. Yeah. Um, why did you decide to go get your MBA? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, and it's funny, I went a little bit later than average, right? So I think most people, especially today, it seems like the trend is, you know, is sort of, uh, and it kind of moves a little bit, but the average age in business school is 24, 25, 26. I went when I was 29, which you know isn't a huge difference, but you know it was definitely the older end of my class. And um, uh, I decided to go because I was sitting at CBC, and this was probably like year four, and I was like, "This is interesting," but I feel like I've learned all the most of what there is to learn. And at the end of the day, the debate in private equity is, you know, is this company going to grow three percent a year, or is it going to grow at six percent a year? Because that matters for my economic model. And you know, private equity. I mean, just I don't know how many, how many of you know sort of the basics of private equity, right? But you're buying sort of older, more established companies that generate cash flow, that are very stable, and you're trying to marginally increase the performance of those businesses over time, right? And so companies in our portfolio are things like Samsonite. So pretty like iconic household names, but not like 
radically disruptive technologies, right? So it's a very different exercise being in venture capital than it is in private equity where, you know, in private equity you're not debating the future of a market, you're basically just hoping that this thing, you know, you kind of keep the ship on, on course, you know, you hope nothing goes wrong, three to five years later you sell it to somebody else for more, they kind of do the same thing, they sell it to somebody else for more, um, you know, it's, it's a very different sort of exercise than, than venture capital. So I knew that something was lacking, but I didn't know what in terms of like career satisfaction, but I didn't know exactly what it was. And so I figured business school was a great way to go figure out, you know, what I really wanted to do when I sort of grew up. And so uh, at Wharton, talk to us about the importance of a network and starting to, to meet people and, and give first uh, and, and really build out, you know, your, your own personal and professional network. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's the most uh, valuable thing that I got out of business school. So if any of you are thinking about going to business school or have gone to business school, you can relate to this. Um, you know, that it's, it's not what you learn in the classroom, right? I mean, you, you know, most of that was kind of in one ear and out the other, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> it was really like the conversations in the hallways, you know, the social stuff. I mean, a lot of my closest friends, even in Los Angeles, are people that I went to business school with. Um, you know, it's just the, the, the way that you bond with somebody when you're, you're having beers with them at 4 a.m. and they see you in all sorts of, you know, situations, um, you know, you, you develop these really sort of like familial relationships. And I think um, that takes the friction out of doing business in the future or helping each other in the future, right? And so it's this really authentic, deep connection that you have to people that you went to business school with. It's like when you're part of the SEALs, right? When you go through totally, training. Yeah. yeah, I mean a little bit. I mean, no, seriously, yeah, I'm, not right. even, I'm not even joking. Yeah. It's the same thing when you have a startup and you have a community of people that you right. bounce ideas off of. And, you and when you look at the mafias, right? Like look at the, pay, the PayPal mafia is a great example, right? Or like early Google employees. I mean, the, um, the network effect to being part of that early, uh, that story and that sort of tight knit group is incredibly powerful. Um, you know, a lot of the guys that are part of the PayPal mafia, had they not been part of the original founding team, I mean, they're all, except, you know, all exceptional people, but you know, they maybe wouldn't have gotten as far uh, today as they had because they were part of that sort of original you know, narrative. So I mean, Wharton, I mean, Wharton's not nearly like that, but um, you know, there are, there's power to those networks. Of course, and so while you're at Wharton, you weren't just going to business school, right? You were, you were getting yeah, outside I mean, of the building. Yeah, I mean, so right? you should never go to business school without a goal in mind, right? Because two years go by incredibly quickly. It's really socially distracting, and so, in a good way, right? Like, there's just like five parties a night, and so, you know, you might wake up two years later, you know, you have a beer belly, and you know, you spent $200,000 and you haven't accomplished anything, right? And like, a couple, few of my classmates ended up doing that, unfortunately. They get to graduation and they're like, oh shit, I need a job. The debt repayments start pretty quickly and so you don't wanna do that, right? So I got to Wharton and I was like, all right, my goal was to figure out what I wanted to do. It, there were probably three things that, you know, could be interesting, uh, you know, that I haven't sort of tried yet. One is starting a company. Uh, the second was working for a great entrepreneur. And the third is to go back into investing but to do it at a much earlier stage. And so I was like, I have two years, I'll divide it up into thirds and try all three of these things if I can. Um, so I tried starting a company, and business school is a tough place to start, try to start a company, because you're incredibly distracted, right? I mean, a lot, how many people in the room, by the way, are entrepreneurs, or just trying, working on their, their companies, right? So you guys, I mean, I think most of you probably appreciate, right? Like, it's an all-consuming thing. It's, uh, you know, your friends go to the wayside for a while, like, even relationships, right? Like, you know, it's, it can be an incredibly consuming experience. And so business school is just a tough environment because you get pulled in a lot of directions. And so I sort of, you know, six or seven months into trying to start something, realized maybe I should wait until later, or, you know, maybe now's now the time. Um, and so I was getting to my time between my first and second year of business school. Um, you have the ability to do an internship that's, you know, that summer, and it's generally up to you to figure out what you want to do. And so I um, was like, okay, well, if I'm not going to be an entrepreneur, I want to go work for a great entrepreneur. And so I, through a matter of sort of good luck and serendipity, was connected to Brian Lee, who started LegalZoom, The Honest Company, and Shootazzle, um, and ended up joining The Honest Company as sort of intern number one. So it was, uh, you know, in, I think our entire office was like a room the size of this sort of chair area. It was like, me, Brian, Jessica Alba, Cash Warren, and like three other people, um, you know, at the launch of what's now become you know, the second most valuable startup in Los Angeles. So pretty, pretty cool uh, experience. That was for three months, is that right? 
that was for three months. Uh, at the end of the summer, Brian's like, drop out of business school, come work for me, and in retrospect, that probably would have been, you know, that would have been <laughs> interesting, for sure. Uh, but I really wanted to finish school, and I kind of left this third thing unchecked, which was being an investor. And so I went to Brian at the end of the summer, uh, you know, when he was generous enough to make that offer, and I said, um, you know, Brian, um, you know, I flattered, but I want to try my hand at early stage investing. And um, he connected me to a couple of his friends, um, one of whom uh, was Ron Conway and David Lee at SB Angel. And so I ended up interning for them the second year of business school, uh, did a program called Wharton in San Francisco. So Wharton has a campus in the Embarcadero in San Francisco. Um, and my class was the first class where they piloted a program where you could spend a semester in SF uh, as, uh, you know, as a full-time student. Um, and so concurrent with taking classes, I would you know, go to class between nine and two, or maybe not even go to class and go to SB's offices and um, you know, work, uh, work uh, next to Ron and David and all those guys. It was a pretty, pretty awesome first experience. And how many years ago was this? Uh, this was three and a half, four years so ago. So this is fairly recent. Yeah. So first-hand experience of someone in Silicon Valley. Yep. Tell us what it was like to, to go to San Francisco um, and how would you compare the startup scene there to here? Yeah. So I'd say um, I can't make an apples for apples comparison, right, because that was four years ago and tech investing as you know we all know has evolved dramatically since then and los angeles has really grown since then right i mean i think the feel of the valley hasn't dramatically changed um in the last couple of years but the feel of los angeles like you know three or four years ago i don't think you could pack a room with these many people you know in an event like this right and i mean Definitely now not. there's you know three or four events like this every week and so every um, night every night well yeah exactly. yeah <laughs> yeah thank good you good choice public, everyone yeah, yeah, um <laughs> but uh Right, so I think um, that's, there's something that's you know, fundamentally changed about LA, whereas Silicon Valley sort of stayed the same. And so I think, um, you know, San Francisco, look, it's an order of magnitude larger than Los Angeles, right? And so I think the reality is um, it will always be a bigger ecosystem. Startups are what San Francisco do. Um, that said, LA is a much more diverse ecosystem. Um, you know, we are an ecosystem of creators and dreamers and uh, an ecosystem that understands the mainstream consumer better than San Francisco does, right? So I, I spend a lot of my time in consumer investing and a market difference is a lot of the companies that I see in San Francisco are building for the top 1%, right? They're sort of these high-end premium organic food delivery solutions, right? Whereas Los Angeles, um, you know, the core sort of, um, one of the core things this town does well is understands how to get butts in seats, right? It's always been a movie making town the way you make money in the movie industry is by filling up theaters. And so we understand how to target the hearts and the minds of mainstream America, which is why a lot of the companies that we've built, like Dollar Shave Club, um, are much bigger and broader than their analogous uh, companies in San Francisco, right? So Dollar Shave Club will always be bigger than Harry's, I think. Um, you know, the honest company, right? Really filling this huge void in the market um, that you know, really understands sort of the consumer and hit a chord with the consumer. Um, you know, uh, and there's countless examples like that. So I think we would all agree that the Valley is pretty much developed or overdeveloped at this point. Where would you say we are in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles startup ecosystem growth? Yeah, I think it's really early, right? So um, when you look at New York, and I think New York's like a good analog because similar to LA, it has a pretty diverse economy. It's not just a tech economy. Um, a lot of people that have spent time in New York say that LA reminds them of New York three or four years ago. Um, so I think there is a, um, so, so I think it's still early days, right? And what, so, so what does that specifically mean or why do I think there, it's early days? Um, one, we haven't had, th we've had some good exits, but we haven't, a, we haven't had a huge number of exits. And the reason that's important is because when you have an exit, you create a mafia, right? So you create um, people that economically get rewarded and typically reinvest those economic gains back into the ecosystem. So you have second time entrepreneurs, third time entrepreneurs that are starting companies, that are angel investing, that are mentoring. And we have a few examples like that, right? Like Brian Lee is a great example of that. We're now he's on company number four with Holler. Um, you know, he started BAM Ventures, which is a really active investor. He gives a lot to the entrepreneurs in Los Angeles. Adam Miller at Cornerstones, another great example. He does the LA Tech Summit. Um, you know, they've incubated some great companies and he's really giving back. Um, but you know, I can count those guys on one hand, right? So Brian and Adam's uh, impact has been tremendous, but there aren't that many Brian and Adams. Whereas in Silicon Valley, you could fill a room this big with people that are of that stature and have had that kind of success and are giving back. And so that's what LA needs more of. We need more exits 
um, you know, more big exits, and then more people with the mindset that once they've had that exit, you know, instead of going to the beach, they you know reinvest and roll up their sleeves and want to work with the next generation of entrepreneurs. How often do you see people concerned with how easy it is to get um, engineering talent in Los Angeles? A lot, and it's a crazy thing, right? Because we graduate seventy percent of the computer science majors. We have Caltech, UCLA, USC, um, LMU. Out, right, tons of schools, and yeah, you know, like, like Harvey Mudd. <laughs> Poor LMU. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Great school. Um, Claremont McKenna, Harvey Mudd. Um, right, so phenomenal institutions. But um, I think if you're in the mindset of a 21 year old that's graduating, right, and you're like, I have an offer at Facebook or I have an offer at Google, there wasn't that sort of competing offer in LA until recently. But now it's like, if I get an offer at Snapchat versus Google, Snapchat's like a lot cooler than Google, right? Like, I bet the win rate of people that have offers at both companies, like Snapchat probably wins most in most situations because Google's a little bit past its prime, right? And, and Snap, well, I don't know if it's past its prime, but it's past its prime from a being appealing to a 21 year old as a place to work, right? Versus Snapchat re really relevant, right? Tinder really relevant, Honest Company, you know, really relevant to sort of the days, you know, sort of our daily lives in addition to being great places to work. So um, I think LA is finally creating that set of opportunities. And so you've been with Pritzker Group for how long now? Um, I've been in Los Angeles for a little over two years. Okay. So now let's just jump right into Pritzker. How did the opportunity come about out of Wharton? Um, yeah. Tell us that story. Yeah, it's another one of these. Brian, so Brian Lee was like, um, my, I guess my lucky break, right? Like everyone in Hollywood has their lucky break or whatever Brian was mine. And, um, and uh, I, um, Brian is in the same YPO chapter, a young president's organization, uh, as Tony Pritzker. And so... Brian connected me to Tony when I was looking for, I had a couple of offers to go to firms in San Francisco, and I thought sort of long and hard about them, but you know, I still sort of had, like my heart was in LA, I had such a great summer, um, you know, the weather is awesome, the lifestyle here is great. Um, you know, and I just felt like being part of something that was, um, you know, young and growing was more exciting to me than just being another guy doing the same thing on Sand Hill Road, right? I mean, you could fit every venture capitalist in LA um, into, like that little conference room, right? If you pack us in, versus in San Francisco, you'd fill this entire office up, and that'll be like all just be, you know, like late stage VCs, right? So it's the job is really different, right? And sort of what you do is really different when you know you're one of 500 versus when you're one of you know 30 or 40 or 50. Um, and so that was appealing to me. And so um, I was lucky that Brian connected me to Tony. Um, I flew down here, uh, met him. You know, we had a four hour conversation, hit it off, and. Uh, and that's why I ended up down here. And so, what what exactly has happened since since you you joined? I mean, you've hit the ground running. Uh, talk to us about you know what the first year uh, was like. Yeah, I mean, I think um, so. I was you know most of you know Mark Seuster. He writes a great blog, right? And so I think one of the things that I one of the really early blog posts that I read um, on that, that Mark wrote about was his early days of being a VC. He wrote a really honest piece on you know what it was like. And one of the one of the things that I walked away with is. When you're new in VC, you don't want to do a ton of deals, right? You want to be really careful because even the things that I thought were true two months ago as a venture capitalist, I now question. And so it's just a rapidly evolving space with many more ways to, um, uh, there are many more things that can go wrong in early stage companies than, than go right, right? And so the failure rate of startups is really high. But unless you have the, um, you know, launch, unless you have longevity or a lot of, Unless you've seen a lot, um, you know you don't know what those hundred ways are that things can go wrong. And so Mark didn't make an investment for his first two years as a venture capitalist. Um, and so um, what I, you know, I, and at the end of the day, I think the philosophy for me is right. Like if you're trying to build a career in anything, um, you know, it's a, it's not a sprint; it's a it's a marathon. And so you want to make sure that you take your time. You really sort of figure out what your niche is. Um, you know, you start developing your network. You know, you really sort of go deep into a couple of sectors where you feel like you're developing knowledge and you know you're you're differentiated in some way. And so uh, for me that was you know spending a lot of time with consumer and digital media entrepreneurs, that's what I do. Or that's what I focus on for the most part. Um, and not being and being a little bit trigger shy in the beginning, right? So I got lucky insofar as you know the honest company was raising its Series B and that was my first deal and that's gone you know incredibly well. And you know Dollar Shave Club was sort of a seed stage company in our portfolio that I you know inherited and sort of then you know, let subsequent investments in, um, but I didn't make a significant investment 
you know, outside of both, those were both obviously really significant, but outside of those two for, you know, the next six or seven months. So, um, you know, obviously by the show of hands, there's a lot of entrepreneurs here tonight. Um, define what a venture backed company is, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions that if you have a startup, you need to go raise VC money or you need to go raise money in general. But um, what type of company should look for venture funding? Yeah, so this is a really specific question. Or, or I have a very specific answer to this, right? So um, venture capital um, is risk capital. It's high risk capital, right? So the opportunity cost of taking venture is very high, right? So when you raise money for your startup, you dilute your ownership pretty significantly. Um, and so it has to be worthwhile to you to take that capital. Um, that, that's sort of from your perspective, right? From a venture capitalist perspective, I get to make a limited number of bets a year and I'm looking for large exits. Um, and so um, the way that I think about the, you know, the, the, the marriage of that, right, is when you have companies that need to gener need to spend significant cash to grow. So typically you're cash flow negative for a while before they're able to become cash flow positive. So that's what venture capital from a financial perspective serves to fund. Um, and we fund companies that rapidly scale, right? So there needs to be a dynamic in the industry um, that you're going after um, or in the company that you built um, where you know you have the ability to get to rapid scale because that's the way that we make our return right you you have a company that goes from you know uh, zero to ten to a hundred to a thousand not you know zero to two to five to seven to ten um, because unfortunately the economics of that just don't work for us given the you know the cost of our capital um, so um, the vast majority of businesses in America are not venture businesses, and the vast majority of wealth creation in America from entrepreneurs has not been in venture-backed businesses. And so there's no sort of shame in not taking venture. Um, you know, you just have to assess realistically whether or not the growth characteristics of your company and your business model are appropriate for venture. Um, and if they're not, that's totally cool, right? Like 95% of wealth has been created in entrepreneurship outside of venture-backed companies. So what type of return uh, is, you know, Pritzker, a normal VC looking for? We hear 100x or, you know, you hear 10x. What, what is a number that you're looking for in regards to what the market is worth and how much they can capture? I was, it's a really hard question to answer. Um, you know, you look for, um, it's, it's about portfolio construction, right? So not to get sort of too boring or esoteric, but, um, you know, you make a limited number of bets in a fund um, and um, you're, you know, these things typically follow a pattern where, you know, you're hoping that you have a couple of huge hits, because you're gonna have a lot of zeros, right? So you have to make up for those zeros. And then you have a bunch of stuff that's kind of in between and does okay, doesn't necessarily knock it out of the park, but you know, is a decent return. Um, so you know, you want, you know, you want your Honest or you want your, you know, Snapchat for all of your fab.coms, um, and then, um, you know, you'll have a bunch of, really, you know, modest, good outcomes in between. So um, talk to us about the value in ideas versus people in regards to investing. So you obviously have a big filter. I don't, I'm guessing it's not as easy as just sending you an email, but right. then there's a few hoops you have to go through before you get a real meeting. Yeah, um, yeah I mean the best, so I'll just stop there, right? The best way to do that is to find somebody that knows me, right? And I think, well, or you know, feel free to come up to me, but um, the best screen that I use is typically somebody that I've co-invested with, an entrepreneur that I respect, um, you know, if, uh, that's the best way to get to VCs, right? I mean, cold emailing never really results in anything. Um, you know, I'm sure most of you can, if you've tried doing that, it's very rare that you never get somebody to respond to you. So somebody that is a legitimate investor to respond to you, right? Um, and so what you want to do is figure out who in your network knows that person um, and get that source to refer you. Um, and the reason that's important is not because, you know, we, we like to play hard to get, it's just you get inundated as an investor, right? I get, you know, 20 new business, we have 10, 20 new things, a day sometimes, you know, and, and so just, you're overwhelmed by the volume of stuff, and so you need to have another filter in there to be able to get through kind of all the noise. So now that we're, we're through the noise, yeah. you, you meet with the entrepreneur, um, how much does the idea matter versus the person who has the idea? That's a really good question. Um, I think ideas are mostly commodities, right? Like everything's been thought of, right? So like I rarely get blindsided by an idea where it's like, Oh my God, this thing is a revolution. I've never thought of it. And it's so innovative that, you know, um, if this idea were made public, you know, um, there could be five other people that execute on it. And this guy, you know, like this guy has to keep his idea really secret, secretive or whatever. Like, I, I, I don't believe, I think 
stealth mode for a lot of things is pretty overhyped. I think you get more value by telling people what you're trying to do so that people can be helpful. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's all an execution game, right? So is it, so what we're looking for, right, is entrepreneurs that can break down walls, right? We're looking for the people that will work 80 hours a week, that will max out their credit cards because they believe so much in the idea before they get venture capital, that have quit their jobs and are working on something full time. You know, we're not looking for the entrepreneur, right, that's sort of, that's trying to create optionality in their life. We're looking for somebody that's like, you know, maniacally feels like what they're doing is the right thing for them and is going to change the world in some way, and that they sell us on that vision. That's the kind of entrepreneur that we get the most excited about. Um, so it's all the people, the, you know, especially in early stage investing, you know, very, very much not the, I mean, the idea can be bad, right? The, the person can be good and the idea can be bad and we wouldn't invest there. But if an idea is great, that isn't, that's sufficient, but not, you know, uh, that's necessary, but not sufficient for us to invest. And so is there a system, like do you sit with your partners and uh, they come and pitch uh, and, and there's feedback? Talk to us about the process. Yeah, so I, I, I'll talk sort of generically about venture capital processes. Ours is fairly similar, right? Which is that you go and pitch a firm, right? And what you wanna do is get to the person. So a firm is a collection of people, right? And people are all different, right? And so at the end of the day, you wanna to get to the person in the venture firm that you think based on their bio understands what you're trying to do. Um, and so, you know, pitching me on a uh, data science heavy, um, you know, uh, security company um, is probably not the right thing versus, you know, given the fact that I've done Holler and Casper and the Honest Company and Dollar Shave Club, right? So I'm our e-commerce guy, I'm our digital media guy. You can tell that by reading my bio for 30 seconds. You can tell my partner Chris is the guy that you want to pitch, um, you know, if you have the former idea, right? And so it's not only important to get to Pritzker um, or to get to a firm, but it's important to get to the right person in the firm. Um, for whom what you're doing will resonate. Um, and then once you've done that, because what that person does, right, is they, they're the expert in the space. Um, you know, they meet with you. If they get excited about it, they go to their partnership. Um, you know, most firms have Monday morning meetings where you go through everything that we've been looking at that week or we've been looking at that's sort of active. And, you know, that's where the real debate starts, right? That's where, um, you know, my partners say, well, we looked at this, did you think about that? I looked at this company back in, you know, three years ago that was doing something similar, you know, why do you think this one's better? And that's where you start getting the real sort of power of the firm um, when you know you have the partners um, all sort of actively debating something. Um, uh, but you want to have the right advocate of the firm uh, bringing in your deal. And when an entrepreneur is pitching you guys, uh, do you ever push back on their idea or on their opinions to see how much they waver? Yeah, really hard. Um, that's, that's our job, right? So we, um, we want to look for, and it's hard, right? Because you you want you you're looking for intellectual flexibility and a lack of arrogance, but you also want somebody that believes, right? And so it's this fine sort of balance, right? Or sort of personality that you're looking for, which is that you know they they know they uh, know what they don't know and are willing to admit it um, and are honest about it. I'm um, willing to learn, but also have firm commit, you know, sort of like firm views on the you know what they're trying to do and aren't so sort of wishy washy that like. At the end of the day, you feel like they're too impressionable, and if they happen to get a week of bad data, they rapidly pivot the business model, right? Because that sort of doesn't result in a good outcome typically either. So, um, as far as you know, your sweet spot goes. You talk about consumer. You talk about digital media. Uh, let's touch on the the trends that you see developing now, or that have been developing in the last twelve months that interest you in in those spaces. Yeah, so I think in consumer, bo I'll just talk about this really broadly, and then I'm happy to answer specific questions, you know, as it relates to your guys' businesses or whatever. Um, but I think in consumer, um, you know, millennials are consuming really differently, right? So we're the generation of experiences, not of stuff. And when we buy stuff, we want the stuff to have a narrative, right? Which is why, um, or we want to feel like we're buying something that's bigger than just a razor, or something bigger than, than just a cup of coffee, or bigger than just a mattress, which is why, you know, Blue Bottle and Intelligentsia and Casper um, and Dollar Shave Club have done, have done as well as they have. And so, um, you know, these objects are a um, extension of our personalities. Um, you know, what we wear, what we use reflects who we are, I think, in a way that is not true for prior generations. And so I think these direct-to-consumer businesses are fascinating um, because um, they're, they're playing on that sort of, uh, you know, just massive generational shift. Um, and so that's sort of what excites me in consumers, sort of thinking about what the next verticals are that will be disrupted by that. I mean, Casper's a great example, right? So, um, you know, when it initially came in, it was like, we're gonna invest in a mattress company, like what does that have to do with technology, right? Like horrible industry, cyclical, like 
you know, you have Serba Simon Sealy, it's like an oligopoly, you know, maybe Tempur Pedic disrupted the industry a little bit, but like even that's gone through its cycles, like what's cool about this Casper thing. But then the bigger picture that really excited us is well, you know, we're the most health conscious generation as well, right? And sleep is something that I think a lot of people take really seriously, right? The sleep, the sort of the number of articles that you read about sleep consciousness um, and you know how important sleep is in our lives, getting the eight hours, um, you know, that's something that you know is uh, you, you have the overworked baby boomers that don't get enough sleep, um, and you're having this sort of this now notion that it's okay to be well rested, right? It's okay to take the eight hours of sleep, and there's no product that really served that. There was no lifestyle brand around sleep that resonated with millennials, you also had a horrible shopping experience, right? So I don't know how many of you have gone mattress shopping, but it's like buying a used car where, you know, you go from one retailer to another, there's total opacity across retailers, so you can't shop a specific mattress across different retailers because they purposely uh, change the names of the mattresses, so you can't shop price. And so horrible experience, you know, sleep consciousness, but no brand that had owned that, a team that had done it before, um, you know, and had an incredible sense for brand and consumer preferences, and that was sort of the birth of Casper, which has now become the fastest growing e-commerce company that we've ever seen. So, um, when you make deals like that, do you feel like it's right away gut feeling this is right, or is it somewhat polarizing and it makes you kind of reevaluate? It's so polarizing, right? I mean, the immediate reaction was like, a ma like seriously, a mattress company? Like, what are you doing, right? Like. <laughs> Like you're gonna waste our Monday morning meeting talking about mattresses, right? Like this is a horrible industry. My buddy at KKR, when he bought Sealy, lost a bunch of money, and Tempur Pedic. Look at what their stock price has done. Like you know, this is and and it's physical product, and there's inventory and shipping and returns and you know uh, safety issues with like fires and whatever. And so there was a lot to get over internally um, on that one. So uh, I have like one or two more questions, and then we'll open it up to to Q and A. So. Uh, cue all of your questions. I'm sure you have a lot uh, to ask Shirag about. But I, I just want to talk about the future. Um, first and foremost, uh, for Pritzker. Yep. Tell us, uh, do you have any internal goals um, yeah, as, so as one, a group? Yeah, so we're doubling the size of our team in LA, which is really exciting. Um, so we are in the process of uh, onboarding um, a couple of folks uh, in the next year. Um, so I think we're just super excited to kind of build our presence here. You know, as I mentioned, we started the office three and a half years ago. We've made 21 investments in LA. I think you'll continue to see us do more and more um, you know, of that and sort of build out our presence here. Um, so I think that's, that's exciting for Pritzker in LA. Um, we're also doing the same in New York. Um, so you know, we've made 12 investments in New York in the last year. Um, and you know, we see a lot of synergy between the two ecosystems. Um, just a quick 30 seconds on that, right? So all the great digital media platforms have been built in Los Angeles or New York. Um, BuzzFeed, Vice, and Vox are New York, and uh, you know, the makers and full screens, all the video innovation is happening here, and those two are finally merging, right? And so there's a tremendous amount of synergy between the ecosystems when it comes to digital media and also direct to consumer brands, right? So the Etsy's, Warby's, um, you know, uh, Bobble Bars um, of the world are in New York, the Honest and Dollar Shave Clubs um, are here, um, and so. These are ecosystems in which, you know, digital media and consumer, in which New York and LA actually have a leg up, I think, over San Francisco. And there's just a lot of cross pollinization of talent, um, you know, between these ecosystems. People are moving from, particularly from New York to LA this time of year, uh, when they come on the recruiting trips out here and it's, you know, 80 degrees warmer uh, here than it is there. Um, so uh, so I, think that's, I think that's super exciting. Um, uh, and so we're, we, you know, we, we see that as a huge trend. And so we're kind of doubling down. You know, we already, We've been in Chicago forever. Um, you know, we we sort of we're, we've done a great job there, and so I think the future for us is you know really just focused on building out Los Angeles, building out New York, um, and then unleashing synergies between those two ecosystems. And now I'm sure your personal goals somewhat align with with Pritzker, but talk to us about uh, what what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to accomplish? Do you have interest in starting a company? Do you want to run till the end with uh, venture capital? You know, what are what is on the horizon? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question, right? I mean, I think one of the one of the frustrations that most venture capitalists feel is, um, you know, what I pointed out earlier in our conversation, right, which is that you're still a little bit removed from the action at the end of the day, right? So you're funding companies, you're on the board, you know, you're even spending a lot of time with the companies, right? So early in their, you know, Hello Giggles is a company that I was on the board of, 
we just sold the Time Inc. Um, a couple months ago, uh, but it's a company that I ended up spending a ton of time out in the early days. There's just a lot of stuff to be done. And so, you know, instead of being kind of the investor that would come in for board meetings, I was like, let me be an extra pair of hands that I was actually there, you know, spend a day a week kind of thing and really just help, right? And so, um, you know, it was a really fun experience, but at the end of the day, you go home, you go back to deal land, and the team is still working day to day on building this company, right? And so, um, I think, I don't know. I mean, I, I love doing what I do today. Um, I can see myself doing it for the next, you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, I can also see myself, you know, potentially building a company. It's uh, TBD, I guess. TBD, yeah. <laughs>